Okay, let's start with the presentation. And thank you for adding your challenges already. Now, in this presentation, it will be simple in, in the way that I'm trying to get the general ideas into the presentation. And if you hear a cat meowing, it's my cat. <laughs> I have a cat running about, and I'm at home. And um, now, it, because of the because it's an introduction, everything is only mentioned briefly. But if you are interested in something uh, more, or you need some details which are more in-depth into a certain topic, feel free to put it in the chat as well, because then I either can uh, ask or send it to one of the facilitators later on, or try to make it a collaborative uh, answer afterwards. Okay. okay, let's start with the general stuff. So. Oh, I forgot to present myself. So my name is Inge de Waard. I work at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, in Belgium, uh, which means that in, I have been engaging in mob and developing mobile learning projects in some challenging areas, uh, like in Peru or in Morocco or collaboratively worked in uh, India or in, in a number of places. And um, I've been into mobile learning for about, I think, six or seven years uh, by now. And I was, I started with e-learning in 1999, so 13 years. And I really love it. I, uh, I'm passionate about online learning or learning with technology, so that's why this Mobi MOOC uh, also started. Now, uh, so on the definition of mobile learning, I think, or it is my opinion, that in about a couple of years we will no longer be speaking about mobile learning. It will just be learning or online learning in general, because everything moves towards a more accessible, in the cloud uh, type of content. Now, of course, depending on the region and the infrastructure, this can uh, the timing of these ubiquitous uh, options might be different. But in the meantime, the devices keep on developing, and there are more and more devices which you can use for mobile learning. Not only this, the high-cost tablets or the smartphones or the really expensive uh, mini netbooks and everything, but you can also do it with very simple MP3 tools or basic cell phones who can just be used for SMS or for uh, phone conversation, something like that. So there is quite a variety, including ebooks and everything as well. Now, choosing those those devices can be sometimes difficult, but I would first always think about the strengths that you have before moving into a possible mobile learning plan. Because if, even if you look at all of our, our introductions, you can see that we have an immense experience, each one of us. And no matter how you put it, if you have lived or walked the earth for 20 years or more, you're going to have a lot of experiences anyway. So it's good to start from those, because it keeps you in a more comfortable place. Now, it's also important to look at the needs uh, and to see from your own experience or your own setting what type of solutions uh, can or need to be developed to answer to those needs and to get an idea of the possible dilemmas you might encounter or the resistance you might encounter, like the skepsis towards mobile learning. As one uh, person mentioned, as a possible challenge, they are still there, although there are so many 
successful mobile learning projects. And it's also good if you are in an institute or in a corporation to have a look around and see if there isn't one person, or it might be yourself as well, who already started something with a mobile device. Sometimes people just uh, test something and those are good collaborators to have in your project once you want to launch something. It's also good to use what works. Don't make it too difficult. Don't uh, start with a huge step. Uh, start small. It's always better. It's what you do naturally, uh, normally as well. So if SMS is something that everybody uses, start with the SMS project. If it's something like sharing audio, start with MP3s, or really keep it very simple and close to the things that people are using uh, in the first place. Now, of course, it's also interesting or necessary to plan and organize to keep it comfortable let's say, because it's going to be a huge challenge anyway, the first uh, mobile project or even the tenth, I think. There are always ideas that you haven't or didn't imagine. Now, if you're going to roll out a mobile learning project which is embedded in an already existing learning structure, it might be a little bit difficult or you might meet a lot of resistance because people say what we have is working, it's just uh, how can we make sure that it will be successful uh, if you use mobile devices and there is so much more to think about. So it's the same as I mentioned before, start simple, use participatory evaluation and development, hear what others uh, have done and make sure that you can have an idea of the cost or the, the cost of the data plan or the cost of a mobile device if you decide that you work with one type of device. I wouldn't advise you to do that, but it might be a good startup or starting point. And if you are looking at embedding a mobile learning project inside of your curriculum, it might be good to follow the uh, week which is facilitated by Adele Bota, who has come up with a mobile learning curriculum framework, which is a nice couple of modules or pieces that you can just pluck and put inside your own uh, learning framework. So that's all it makes it easier to use what others have uh, as building blocks. It's, of course, just like any online education program, it's important to look at the target population. But with mobile devices or a mobile learning project, it is very important that you also look at the technical skills and at the technical uh, options that they have, so the infrastructure, or the time at their disposal, because you don't want to overload someone who has already some limitation on their timing or on their time, professional time, personal time. And it's also good to look at some motivation. If they don't feel there is a need, chances are they are not going to be very interested in a new educational or training project. So motivation is, as we all know, a good uh, thing to have. Some of these things that I mention here you might of course know because you're experienced educators but nevertheless I'm going to go through it step by step for those who aren't that experienced uh, yet. And if by any chance, well the chances are big, but if you go through the presentation and you feel that I've missed something, please add it in the chat as well because it's very, this is a collaborative uh, endeavor and in, it's my experience that I learn much more from others so I would be grateful for any remarks. 
Now, if you start with a mobile learning project, it's also important before setting up the technical specifications and the approaches you're planning to really know what type of learning interaction you will probably be using. Will it be one-to-many? Will it be one-to-one? -one? Will it be peer-to-peer -peer, like in a MOOC? If you know about those types of learner engagements, it's easier to fine-tune on possible mobile learning tools once you, are, you start with the uh, real planning of the project. And now there are, well, I define 10 steps towards M learning strategy. 10 is such a general number, there, going, there has to be more than 10 steps. But these are, well, good starting steps, let's say. So it's good to define the goal of your mobile learning project. It's good to get all the stakeholders involved, not only the target population, but also the ones who need to be convinced. And you need to fine-tune the learner dynamics that you have in mind, like I said before. Also, which type of mobile infrastructure or infrastructure uh, is there in the target area where you want to roll out your project? And what's the mobile situation of your target audience? And the mobile situation might be as challenging or as easy as, is, as possible, but nevertheless, it's good to really jot it down because it uh, makes it much easier to plan ahead. Now, once you've known the, above, the mentioned steps, it's also important to know whether or not security can be an issue because it security is quite difficult with mobile devices uh, as I've experienced and also to know whether you are going to cater for a wide number of devices so BYOD stands for bring your own device are you going to allow learners to bring their own uh, device for learning or are you going to provide them with a device now, this might have an effect on the durability of your mobile learning project. And also, how will you design the content? Will you be delivering it to your learners? Will you ask your learners to provide some content? Like, uh, if you work with, um, let's say, biologists, you can ask them to uh, provide pictures of a certain type of fauna, uh, uh, flora, I mean or fauna. So, and will you be using or are you able to use social media tools for mobile devices or not? And of course, how will you deliver the content uh, if you plan to provide the content yourself? Because then there's the mobile design, which is uh, important. And then, last but not least, there's the policy. What can be done, what can't be done. It's good to have some kind of criteria or guidelines for your target population. Now, I feel it's important to diversify because we are all different anyway. We have different backgrounds, different cultures, different mindsets, philosophies. So it's good to have some wide array of, of solutions, specifically if you want to address a wide variety or international audience, for instance, because you will have different mobilities, you will also have different infrastructures, you will have different needs, and uh, it is my idea that there are different pedagogies, meaning different uh, sympathies for specific pedagogies, more oral, more visual, more textual. So if you're planning uh, or if you want to start with mobile learning, it's good to provide some added value and which is close to, to their own context or close to their own experiences. And the closer you can get to, it's true for any learning, of course. If it's close to the person, then it's easier to pick up by that same person. 
And then there is also the question of ethics and respect. If you are planning a mobile project, how will it affect the target group? Is there any ethical uh, implication or consideration to take? And if you target a specific group while using a specific kind of mobile device, will it actually be useful for that group? And do you target the complete uh, target population if you have it in a specific way? Let's say, well, I hope I make sense. Sometimes my Flemish comes into the English. So, but uh, it's good to have a pilot, of course, and see if you address both women and men, if that's your uh, option. If you include all the diverse groups that are that could be part of your target learner population, and so on. Then there's also well, it's a little bit following the uh, the philosophical strand here. With the rise of the cell phone, so more and more people could get onto the web, which is nice. But if you look or uh, screen the web, you can see there's some kind of language domination, English, which are, is now well, it's, uh, balancing out a little bit. But anyway, the smaller language groups are not that well represented on the web. And there's also a content domination, so which means that if you ask people to look for content, only look for content, they're bound to have a higher percentage of that northern English kind of dominant content. So it's also good to take into account whether that is something you want to have or whether you want to empower a certain group maybe and deliver content from their own, uh, in their own language with their own uh, view on things. It is my idea that it would be good if the internet becomes a mirror of content. But of course, that's also an idealist look and philosophical look. But some of these questions will be raised by John Trexler, much more in depth, of course, in the second week of MobiMook. So it might be nice to follow that. Now, it's also possible to offer a learning path diversity for everybody uh, to have some content which fits their personal uh, preferences. But if you plan to go to offer a learning path diversity, it's also going to take more time to plan it, uh, to get all the content ready, to get all the modules ready. So it might have an impact on your planning or timetable. And in the end, I feel it's also important to have some openness towards serendipity. People like in MobiMook, people start conversations, you look at the discussions, and all of a, uh, all of a sudden you, or I as an organizer, see that, ah, yes, uh, that should be added, or this uh, is still weak, or I didn't think about like the Google map, for instance, although I asked everyone to add their name, it's not that uh, simple to add your name to a Google map. So I should have added some uh, a small tutorial or something like that. But it can also be much more in depth, like uh, the certification of a course and something like that. So I feel if there's serendipity in a mobile learning project, it's going to increase the quality of your project much mm, or quicker than if you have a formal evaluation at the end of the mobile project. So it's something to imagine. And then there's, of course, the issue of the 21st century. Any more complex mobile learning projects will involve digital skills, and which means that you are already targeting a specific part of your target learner population. Not everybody has the same skills, meaning the, the even the simple curating content skill, uh, looking at several links and deciding which link has the most value in it. 
for us as experienced users, it's uh, more, it feels more natural, but if you target new learners, it's going to be quite difficult. Now, looking at the technical considerations, or a small part of technical considerations, it's of course the connectivity, also the, whether or not there is a stable electricity in the area, if there's a phone diversity, uh, meaning a mobile device diversity, what the total cost for the end user might be. In Belgium, the rates for phone uh, calls are quite steep. And it's also important to know whether or not the mobile internet or SMS is uh, easily used or can be embedded in a mobile learning project quite easily. But if, of course, you are targeting quite a huge amount of learners, it's good to have a talk with the telecom operators as well in certain areas because they can or they might consider offering you uh, lower cost data plans, something like that. In your project in your, or in your technical variety, it's also a matter of how far are you willing to go. So it might be that you are targeting learners who already have quite a variety of mobile devices, tablets, smartphones, netbooks, uh, any type of high-end uh, device. But then again, it might be that you only want to use SMS or you only want to have geolocated driven learning. Uh, uh, or you want to have augmented learning, like for a history class or an architecture class, augmented learning might be very useful because in augmented learning what you do is you put an extra layer of content on your smartphone. So you target your smartphone or your uh, tablet to a specific, with the camera open, the camera of your smartphone or your tablet, you look at a specific building and if you have your GPS location on as well, then the browser of your tablet or your smartphone will have a look at the GPS location and see whether there is content on that specific building. So it's, it's quite complex. It's going to have uh, many layers of mobile design uh, needs that you will have to address. But it has some, for specific fields or areas, it is very interesting. The same with games for learning. If you feel that you work with adolescents, for instance, it might be a good thing to consider serious games to get them uh, motivated to interact with the material as well. But all of these more complex uh, options, of course, will demand much more time to build them. And then I've mentioned it before, the bring your own device or the this is it approach is important for the development. If you target a number of or a variety of uh, devices and if you say to your learner audience, bring your own device, then it's good to look at standards. In this case, for, from a mobile uh, view, it's good to use HTML5 and uh, CSS, which is um, a mobile standard and which allows you to embed videos, to embed audio or multimedia. It's not completely up to point, but it's getting stronger each day. And it's also, it's really a standard, meaning that there are guidelines for developers. So if you develop something in HTML5, it's going to uh, be accessible for, by most uh, devices. If you, you can also decide to go for a specific uh, device, a one device, then it's easier to provide a manual. It's easier to have uh, some training for that using that one device, but it's going to probably cost you more because you will have to provide those technical uh, or those devices. And it's also to make difficult to make it scalable or durable because 
let's say if you have thousand learners, you're going to have to provide thousand devices. And if you have, in, if you look at the rate in which mobile devices are uh, put out there with new versions, new capacities, then it's safe to say that after three years, the device you started with is no longer uh, of use or, or has less potential in about three years. In some areas, um, it's also good to think about other s mobile support uh, features on your mobile devices. For instance, if you have a region where electricity isn't that stable or where you don't have electricity all of the time, it's good to have solar panels to uh, provide some electricity. In the same way, if you are looking at a mobile learning project uh, addressing a community or a team in a rural area, it might be an idea to use a wireless router. A wireless router enables you to make a Wi-Fi hotspot, so um, um, accessible internet within a certain area. That might be easy for, let's say, as I mentioned, rural areas or mountainous areas and something like that. Now, mini SD cards are also interesting for extra storage. If you go out into the field uh, in a rural area and you need to provide some, and you are asking people, maybe researchers, to make movies from certain events that take place there, then you need to have a good storage. And that's something you can provide with mini SD cards. And then the, and something easy in, is to provide a television and a cable. In many areas, they have a television, uh, even if there's no uh, internet. So if you just have a cable going from a smartphone or a mobile or a tablet to a television set, you can address the complete group or a complete uh, village, let's say, just by connecting your phone or your mobile device to that television set. So, well. It's, of course, very brief, brief, a lot of op options. Now, you also want to build a learner community. In, in order to do that, you need to combine the technical features with the human features. So one of the ideas of building a human or a community is to make it scalable and durable. It's trust. It's like a family. You don't always like the family, maybe, but because you come together, because you share your life, it's going to feel closer and you're going to want to do more for your family, no matter what. So from a scalability point of view, it's good to pilot your mobile project uh, from a simple low-cost uh, area then get it scaled up, possibly with the external development or uh, use some participatory evaluations to make it scalable or to scale it up. Always thinking about the design, always the language, always uh, the accessibility of your mobile project to ensure that it is indeed scalable and that it will still cater to the needs of your target population. From a durability point of view, it's good to keep your solutions needs-based and to keep a close eye on the costs of the content and also of the accessibility of your course material. And then, of course, you can approach uh, different mobile generations as well, if you, and I think that's a good, a good way to go, addressing people that have uh, basic cell phones or that have more complex cell phones, but keeping it a, available or keeping or making your content available for a variety of learners and their uh, financial resources or mobile resources. And then, of course, always make sure that, from a durability point of view, always make sure that it's adaptable for the next generation of mobile uh, 
futures. Which isn't that easy, I think. Now, uh, building motivation is, of course, a big chunk of learning and teaching. What you could do is earn as you learn. So participants can get something, but they have to do something for it or they have to work for it. Now, there is also uh, a possibility of creating or uh, pinpointing the, the, the champion or the big Watutsi leader. Um, for instance, last year there were a lot of Mobi MOOC, in Mobi MOOC 2011, there were a lot of people engaged in it. And some of these memorable uh, participants mentioned, hey, I, if you do a second Mobi MOOC, uh, I want to be a facilitator. Well, just get them in as facilitators. You can do the same with your mobile project as well. You start off with some tutors, and then <clears throat> as the course rolls out, you just add uh, or upgrade or uh, enable participants from the first version to become tutors in the second or future versions. And then batches. I'm actually working on three batches for MobiMOOC. It's quite a challenge uh, to get some informal certification going, but it's a good uh, collaborative uh, brainstorm, I think. So that's a way to get people motivated or your learners motivated. Now here's a lot of a slide with a lot of text. So but there are in which I list five ways to strengthen a bring your own device uh, community. Well I'm going to skip this because it's for later reading, but it's it's you can do all kinds of stuff. Of course you can do do a chocolate contest, you can engage people in so many ways and you're all expert educators, so you will know what to do just based on your experience. And there's also, of course, the idea of using different emphasis depending on the different situations you want to get your mobile learning project uh, started in. For instance, if it's in a classroom, you want things to be safe and comprehensible. If it's in a corporate learning setting, you want your mobile learning uh, project to be uh, open to just in time uh, as well. For instance, if you have salespeople in the field, you want to be able to update the latest costs for specific products just before they enter uh, or they start communicating with a, a new possible uh, client. If you have, uh, if you're working or you plan to roll out a project in factories or laboratories, it's good to get an in-depth look of QR codes of augmented reality because engineers might benefit from augmented reality just to see whether or not a specific type of pipeline can be embedded in a certain area, something like that. Those are things who are, of course, existing, but it's good to keep in the back of your mind that if you are working for a specific situation, it's going to affect your mobile learning des uh, design and your overview. And of course, there's also the fun stuff treasure hunts and games and personal social information to exchange, something like that. So it's good to take into account uh, if you want to make a durable community uh, setting. I find that it's also a good thing to get people from specific areas as developers for your project. That way everybody, the whole community in that region is increasing their digital skills, their professional skills and, and everything. So in-country solutions, I'm all for it. For a number of reasons, you also get a better feel to the project and it's, well, it's good for everybody. And if you, as uh, on the challenge of mobile learning design, 
it's good to make interchangeable blocks. It's a bit like uh, e-learning, but even this, the blocks or learning chunks are even smaller with mobile learning than with uh, online learning. It's good to make them small, to make them adaptable, to, uh, and also to be able to, with the beta design uh, in the back of your mind, it's easier to make them fit the next version of mobile technologies. So you can use uh, what, well, I list them here. So one, make some generic designs, specifically the HTML5. Use the QR codes like you see here, and well, it's just good to make it easily adaptable. And one specific area is, of course, addressing disabilities or learning preferences, which uh, might cater to your specific learner uh, audience, like text-to-speech for those who are more into audio or people with, uh, who have uh, specific learner difficulties or adding subtitles to animations or movies or often offer different medias for different learners. But of course, each time you have parallel content development, you have the time which doubles. Now, getting practical, and then we're almost there. It's the last block. Then the floor is open for you. So I have listed some mobile learning projects combining uh, mobile devices for other purposes, like ultrasound. Now, you see a number of lists. I just put them here so you can just go out and have a look afterwards. I will provide this, uh, uh, this presentation on SlideShare. I will put it in a mail just in a couple, let's say, in two hours from now locating where this presentation's slide shares are at, um, also where the recording can be found. And so then you have just your own time to look at all those mobile learning projects. Or add some of your own, of course. Then going for the mobile learning design really quickly. It's good to think about possible tools you can use. Or, uh, but not only the native apps or the smartphone applications, but also real SMS use, uh, catering or setting up SMS communications in rural settings. So it can be a wide variety of mobile learning design issues that you might want to cover before you say, this is the way we are going to go. I just. Uh, it's a good thing to look at the Smashing Magazine uh, list of design. Well, I'm just going to go through this quite easily because it depends on your background or of, on your interest, whether this is of interest to you or not. If you are using an LMS, like Blackboard is already mobile enabled and there are a variety of uh, learning management systems which are mobile enabled. Personally, I like Moodle, but that's just because I like to work, work with open source materials. And here's also a list of mobile authoring tools which you can have a look at. Some of them are really easy to use, like Articulate, but it does use, it isn't always producing a mobile device friendly format uh, as I would like to see it, really, really easy, but it gives good starting options. And then there's, of course, uh, a possibility to develop continued and spaced education for mobile devices. And this, which the design you see here, is just the loop which we created for continued, continued medical education with mobile devices. So people got the content, they were able to do an assessment to see whether they got the latest uh, 
research or got updated on the latest research and then from their own expertise, their own case studies, that content got fed back into the continued medical education and was part of new, uh, newly developed content. And so it was quite an iteration which was going on, which is really, which I find uh, very worthwhile because it creates community feeling and an idea of everybody being as important. Uh, so that's nice. Then you can also go for mobile quizzes. This is quite a challenge as well. I listed some of the options in a blog post. So I'm just, uh, hello Angela, it's, it doesn't matter if you're late. We're going to have a recording of this session anyway, so that's nice. Going through the, so you can also choose to set, to, do something really simple. Set up a mobile blog in which you say, look, uh, every so often I'm going to update some research or I'm going to update the latest uh, news in our company or in our uh, non-profit organization and I'm, uh, or even in, or in the classroom, something uh, really easy. If you use a mobile blog, it's going to be accessible with, uh, sm with cell phones that can connect to the mobile internet. So you don't need to have a smartphone to be able to follow it. Because mobile blogs are in HTML, which means they are easy to read with any mobile device which can access the internet, if you keep it text and picture uh, accessible. So it's a good thing to start and just to get some interest going in your uh, organization or to get your your feet wet, does one say that in English? Just to try out something easy. Here are some M-learning books. I'm not going to go through them. Just simply click on them. Most of them are for free. Just the, late, the last ones are uh, paid versions. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to thank, first of all, all the facilitators and also some people I met in Turin because they uh, added to this presentation. So, that's also nice. Here I am. This is the last slide. I hope the presentation gave you some kind of indication of where you could be going or maybe pinpoint some of the ideas you didn't cover yet, or it gave you ideas about, hey, I, I did some mobile learning projects, and Inge, you are missing some points. Please make sure to put them in the chat or to, uh, I also can give you the microphone. So if you like to, provide some questions, pose some questions, then I'm going to try to answer them if I can. Please write them down. <laughs>